Hello and welcome to the Inheritance Podcast. I'm Joe Riley. I'm a family office advisor and I've always been interested in what people do with their money and what that money ends up doing to them. Our interview today is with Erica Schoenberg and it is a particularly interesting interview because it is like two podcasts in one. First, Eric is himself an inheritor and has many interesting thoughts and insights about growing up with wealth. And second, he has dedicated his academic career in psychology and economics to the study of inherited wealth and produced an excellent limited series on the wills and ultimate depositions of some of America's great fortunes. Eric Schoenberg was educated at Harvard, received an MBA from Wharton, worked as a diplomat at the State Department, and became a partner in an investment bank during the dot-com boom. His experience there led him back to school at Columbia, where he attained a PhD in psychology. He has taught at Columbia and Wharton, and recently released a limited podcast series of seven episodes called You Can't Take It With You. Eric is one of the very few people deeply exploring inherited wealth in academia, and we cover his own inheritance and family life, why he became interested in studying wealth, economic concepts like the bequest motive, revealed preferences, and the wonderfully named spite clause, as well as Eric's considered thoughts on why people do what they do with their fortunes. He also speculates on who was the wealthiest American of all time, and it is not who you think. Just a reminder, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered legal or investment advice. Please enjoy my conversation with Eric Schoenberg. So let's let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your background. Your father was successful. Was he self-made? Yes. So my father was the children of two New York City school teachers, comfortable upbringing, but nothing like wealth. I often joke, I, my father became an entrepreneur, not, I think, because he really aspired to any sort of wealth, but really because he just didn't want to work for anybody else. And honestly, I doubt anybody wanted working to him working for them either. <laughs> I, my father was great at many things, but I suspect he was a terrible employee. So he ended up becoming... He, what was he a terrible employee? What was a... Like a lot of... He liked doing his own. He didn't like having people tell him what to do. And interestingly, I think this is a little different when I look at a lot of other people who accumulate a fair amount of wealth. He was not interested in telling other people what to do either. He was not a very directive person. He didn't perceive that his success in business gave him any greater insight to how to be a good father or parent or anything like that. He just understood it as a lot of luck and just related to things, some things he was good at. And in, in his particular case, as is often the case, right place at the right time, he joined IBM to be a programmer in 1956. So he was really early in understanding the technology computer industry was really going to have a huge impact. As I said, he wasn't a great employee, so he pretty early decided to go his own way. Like a lot of guys, had an unsuccessful business first, didn't get along with his partners, and then eventually started another business in 1967 that, as I noted, was a nice but no means spectacular business through the early 70s. And then starting around 1980 and into the 1980s, started becoming a quite successful and substantial enterprise. I was born in 1962, so I'm saying basically these things were happening in my late high school years and as I was in college. What kind of so a again, company was it? It was a computer services company. Okay. Like leasing or? Like people. It provided programmers, basically, to large corporations like IBM probably was a major client because they had a huge need for programmers and didn't want to hire them all themselves. So that was a basic business. So as I noted, I think the experience of wealth, childhood is such a formative phase for all of us. But in my own case, I had what I would call a fairly middle class childhood. I certainly always expected that I would be like everybody else, would go to college, would get a job, would work my life, blah, blah, blah. It's only when I really get into college that my mother, my father's success is such that I start realizing that, no, my life is going to be a little bit different. I've never really had to have a job to put food on the table. Nevertheless, I've, again, I think because I grew up in a culture where it was my own expectation, I've basically worked well, I don't know, my whole life, it depends on your definitions, but I've had a number of different jobs. I've worked as a, as a United States diplomat. I've worked as a computer programmer. I worked as an investment banker for many years. But now 
linking back to your sort of question about how my background led me to this podcast and my interest in the psychological experience of wealth, I was a partner in a technology-focused bank in the 1990s, and that was a very interesting time to be involved in technology banking. Sure, your listeners who are old enough to remember, and presumably this is almost all of them, we had this great thing called the internet bubble in the 90s, and I had an up-close and personal view about that that particular thing. And I did develop a academic research question out of that experience, which is I tried to convince my partners that we ought to sell the firm in early 2000. The market peak was April of 2000. My predictions turned out to be pretty accurate. And I said, look, if we sell now, we can get a lot of money. If we don't, this thing could completely implode, which is basically what happened to the firm that I was at. And I became very interested in the question of what was that all experience all about? And I made a prediction that turned out to be accurate, but maybe I just got lucky. So I really wanted to understand the question, why did I see the world differently from my partners? I was one of 24 partners in this organization, and I was really the only one who was very eager to sell in early 2000. Motivated by that question and no longer held back by the opportunity cost of leaving banking, which was not what it had been, I decided I really wanted to go study this stuff. So I went to, I went to the psychology department at Columbia University where I did a PhD. And my research was really about how people make decisions in financial markets. And I can summarize my observation quite simply in terms of a phrase that is attributed to John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill once said that men do not desire merely to be rich. Men desire to be richer than other men. And my basic argument, and I have actually published research which demonstrates that there is at least some validity to this, is that in financial markets, people are deeply concerned about how they're doing compared to other people. Psychologists call this social comparison. We know it's a very important process across a whole host of things that people do. I think it's important has been underappreciated in financial markets. And that in point of fact, bubbles where things go, where the price of things seem to get disconnected from what it's really worth, are in fact a perfectly rational response to this deeply held concern about comparing ourselves with other people. Should we think of social comparison or envy as the chief motivator? Yeah, chief motivator is a very difficult question, and it's going to depend a lot on circumstances. What I feel like I've demonstrated is that when people are concerned about relative outcomes, prices in markets can go haywire. My experiment is I run these little experimental stock markets, basically. And in, in the beauty of that is that I can define what something should be worth And then I can see what the price in this market actually is and what is the price gets wildly disconnected from its true value. And the process is accentuated the more you're drawing people's attention to how they're doing compared to other people. So that's the basic idea behind the research. So I'm not claiming that is that that is the major force in markets. I'm not claiming it affects everybody equally. What I am saying, it is an important force, and it's a force that will affect prices. And I do think it's an important consideration when we're talking about the world of the ultra-wealthy. Because the second thing that happened in my story is, is I did come out of this world. I had a lot of connections in the world of family offices. Back in the early 2000s, I just got asked to present basically my other research about bubbles to a group of people from family offices. And I geared the presentation around what the practical implications for portfolio management, blah, 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 were. But having given that talk, I started thinking more about, was in this unusual situation where I'd been doing, I now had a PhD in psychology. I'd been doing a lot of research around behavioral economics. And I'd come across a lot of different articles, studies, or ideas I thought connected to this experience of wealth in interesting ways. Just as one example, there's a lot of research that's been done around trust, right? What makes people trust other people? You know, what destroys trust? Now, if you're in the world of very wealthy individuals, the moment you hear the word trust, you think of something very different. It's a legal entity that we use for assets. And I got to thinking about the basic idea that trust, the legal entity, is a really untrusting device. (laughs) 
right? Its whole purpose, I shouldn't say its whole purpose because there are other purposes, but a major purpose, in particular, when we talk about this category called spendthrift trusts, about which I have a great story in my podcast, the purpose is basically, I want this person to benefit from the money, but I really don't trust them to manage it appropriately. So I'm going to create a structure where they don't have full access to it. They don't have full control over it. Again, doesn't need to be the case. You can certainly set up trusts that don't do these things. But by and large, I think when people do set up trust, that's what they have in mind. So I'm sitting there looking at this research about trust, thinking about it in this other context and realize there's an interesting disconnect here. And I just started doing more and more reading around topics that I thought were relevant to this peculiar experience of inherited wealth in particular. And I started writing about it. And as a result of that, I ended up teaching a class at Wharton for a few years, actually on the behavioral management of family enterprises. My family would be a perfect example. My father sold off his business 30 plus years ago. My family wasn't involved in a business, but there was a lot of proceeds and we do manage assets collectively family partnerships, a whole host of things. So I wasn't interested in how a family operates a business, but I was very interested in how a family with collective wealth manages itself and how it succeeds, how it fails, all of these things. Was there a point when you felt different from the other kids or was that when you were already in college? For me, it's more cognitive, right? It's like I recognize that my life was different from my peers by college time. I've always been interested in money and investing in finance. I, that's something I guess I supported just imbibed from my dad. I'd always been aware of it, but it was only in college that I start realizing, oh, this thing is getting big and you can actually live off that kind of money. And like I said, but again, did it make me feel different? Yes. It made me start thinking about the experience. Again, I I remember probably around this time, I came across his book, Rich Kids. I don't know if you know this one by John Sedgwick. Sedgwick, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and that was one of the first ones where I'm like, oh, again, it's like everything. You have this experience. I mean, pretty obvious that you're not the only person who's had this experience. But unless, again, I didn't go to a private high school. I did go to Harvard. So I certainly encountered plenty of people with money at Harvard. Before that time, it's if you wanted to know what it was like to come from a family of wealth, how would you know? That book was the first time I ever thought, oh, a lot of other people have this experience and they, they start thinking about it too. And so that was the launching point. But again, I would say that my life itself was not in any way, shape or form different because of that awareness. What kind of money messages did you get from your parents? Did your parents talk about the money? No, like most families, it wasn't really a major topic of discussion. My family is remarkably, we're pretty, we're, we get along awfully well around all these issues. And I definitely attribute it to one very specific thing about my father. My father never equated money with love, right? He never had this idea that he could substitute money for love or that money was a way of showing love. For my dad, I think money was always a tool. And like every, like a hammer, you can use it to build a house and you can use it to whack yourself on the head. And I think that is a very healthy attitude. And I think that really is percolated through my family that you need to distinguish between there's money and there's the relationships within the family. And he did not blur those lines. Did your father have specific expectations for you or were you allowed to find your own way? Did you feel in any sense that you were in a shadow? The latter question is, yeah, but I don't think it's anything that he did. I think that is, and again, it goes back to the experience. Look, as I say, if your father founded Standard Oil, the idea that you're going to ever do anything in your life that's going to match up to that, forget about it. You could go into some entirely different direction, try and be a professional tennis player or chess player or whatever it is. In business, that's it. It's over. Game over. And by the way, it's not just that you're never going to match that accomplishment. It's also from a just financial perspective, right? Nothing you're ever going to do is going to affect your financial circumstances. Rockefeller, his story actually is he realizes this. He goes through a nervous breakdown, partly, I think, because of this feeling he could never live up to his father's legacy. And it seems like he comes out of it when he appreciates, you're right. There's no way I'm ever going to live up to my father's legacy about business. So I'm not even going to try. He basically abandoned the business world 
And he decided what his legacy was going to be about was finishing his father's great task of giving that money away. So it was a form of identity, but it was one so closely linked to him. Going back to the question, my father, he didn't define his identity by his kids or by the money for that matter. Again, I know from late life conversations with him that he was extremely gratified by the fact that he had three children. I have an older brother and a younger sister. And he had three children who really made our own way. Again, I, much of my life I owe in many ways to my father, but at a certain level, I did my own things. I had my own successes. Again, all three of us has really worked our whole lives. And my father, like a lot of these guys, he had a lot of friends who were in similar circumstances, fellow. My father, interestingly, he became very friendly with a lot of his competitors in business. That's where he found very close friendships. So a lot of these guys made a lot of money as well. And his observation about their family lives was very different. He just would regularly report back to me, oh, this friend, his son is just not doing, not succeeding. And, and again, my father, we even, one of the best things we did about my dad before he died and really before he needed to have some serious health issues late in life, we did a series of video interviews with him. And I have him saying this point blank on video. He says, look, I said, how do you feel about how things worked out? And he says, look, when I look at my family, things worked out pretty well. I am not going to claim that I created this. What I think I can claim is that I didn't do the things that would have gotten in the way of that success. And again, I think non-directiveness is something that worked in our family. He didn't, he just had kids who were natural. And I do think, and drawing a big picture here, I think if you're in this situation that my father was in of having created a fair amount of wealth and really thinking deeply about what it's for and what to use it for. And again, I don't want to dispute that for most people, including my father, trying to help your kids is a worthy and notable goal. It's just hard to figure out how to do it. I think that there is a lot to be said for the acknowledgement that you take your best shot and you hope for the best. And my father was very open about saying, look, it might have worked out differently. I did some things that in retrospect might not have been a good idea. Let me give you a perfect example. Most people are extremely wary of giving large amounts to young children. And again, I point to John D. Rockefeller as a fascinating example. He wrote very explicitly about this. He said, young children aren't prepared for it. Having said that, John Rockefeller did pass on a substantial amount of wealth before he died. In fact, he passed on virtually all of his wealth to his son before he died. And his son did the same thing. Now, I think most people are very wary because they feel like if you give large amounts of young money to young people, you're going to sap motivation. Seems like a logical theory. I have some problems with the theory. And of course, my problems emerge from my own personal experience, which is my father, for whatever reason, ended up giving us a substantial amount of shares basically in his company when we were all quite young. I think most people would look at that and say, that's a mistake. It was. Yeah, but that was not liquid. When you were 12 years old, you didn't have access to a huge amount of cash. I had access to a lot more cash than most people would think was wise. Okay. And, I've and so done, why, do you and think I've, he, why do you think he did it that way? I don't know. I don't know how, you know, fully reasoned it was. Again, like a lot of money stories, the devil is in the details. And I, ironically, I never actually, my father has passed away. But I never actually inherited. I don't think I inherited anything from my father. Maybe I inherited a little bit. I also never really got a huge amount of gifts from my father directly. What happened was my father's parents had invested in his business when it first went public. And my father's parents, my grandparents, never spent money on anything. So they just had these shares when they died, whatever it was, 20 years later. And my father decided that rather than have those shares go to him, it made more sense for the shares to go to his children. And I don't think he, again, it was not, at the time it happened, I'm not sure what it was worth. It certainly wasn't worth what it would eventually become. And this is not an uncommon story. I remember talking with a guy I think he was a trustee at Wharton. And he mentioned, he learned what I did. And he said, oh, I created a trust for my kids. I thought it was going to be a million dollars. It ended up being a hundred million dollars. Again, this is a problem with success. The Getty Trust is a story like this too. When it was created in the 1930s, I don't know what people expected, but it certainly, I can't imagine they ever would have expected what would become of that trust. So most of your inheritance came from your grandparents. Your father didn't set up trusts for you kids specifically think that is a correct statement. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, that's if, interesting. If you were to sort, and again, partly what I've done with this podcast is trying to create what I would call a biography of a fortune. Like, what? How did the? Where's the money? What's the story of the money? I think if you tracked it all back, yeah, there's a big chunk that basically came from the fact that my grandparents had this stock that they never touched. Yeah. And then when your father died, you inherited from well, again, not really. My father, my father, my parents divorced. My father remarried, so my stepmother, and I think got most of it. My kids, you can sort of sense, I'm not a huge fan of trust for a whole bunch of reasons, but the generation skipping trust or really the generation skipping idea strikes me as a very interesting one. The idea that grandparents will pass money along to the grandchildren. Let's go back to just a very simple observation, people's weird attitudes towards money. This idea that if you give a lot of money to young people, this saps their motivation and they won't accomplish as much as they would otherwise. And there's certainly something to that. But the flip, the obvious flip side of that is, look, money clearly is far more useful when you're young than when you're older, right? Marginal utility in money for one thing, but also investing in a business. If you're young and have access to money, there's all kinds of possibilities open to you that aren't open to other people. I just think this this concern about motivation is misguided because, again, this notion that people, and it does link back to now where I've gone with my research, which is actually, so let me go back to that story for a moment. So I went to school to study financial markets and my research, the publisher's research is about that. I I start thinking more about this world of the wealthy. And as I said, my, my question is always, what's money good for? What I'm saying is part of what goes wrong in financial markets is people are too concerned about how they're doing relative to other people when what they really ought to be concerned about is, are their investments going to fund, provide the money they need to actually spend? There is a very big question in economic theory. Why do people want to be rich? Now, economists, they're not idiots, right? And, but they're trying to simplify the world. And the question is whether they're going too far in their simplification. So their theory about why people want to be rich or why people save money at all is that you save money in order to be able to spend it later. And this certainly describes most people's life experiences. When you're young, you're saving money to buy a house. As you get older, you're saving money for retirement when you're not going to be earning money. And the theory says, oh, so you build up the assets. And then when you retire, you spend these assets down. Now it's maintaining, it's maintaining optionality. We'll come back to optionality because optionality doesn't actually play a large role in economic theory because it's a little hard to know what to do with it. But the idea is that it's all about spending, that the only that the only way people derive utility, that is to say, the only way people derive pleasure or avoid pain through money is by spending. it. That's the theory. Now, there's an obvious problem immediately, which is what about people who leave money behind when they die? Why didn't they spend it on themselves if their whole reason for saving in the first place was consumption? And economists came up with what is called these bequest motives. They said, oh, some people are trying to leave money behind for somebody else to spend when they die. And of course, the most obvious bequest motive that people have theorized is people want to help their kids. So these really rich people are building up the assets because they want the kids and the grandkids to spend the money. Again, like a lot of economic ideas, there is a lot of truth to it. And it comports with some of our basic experience of the world. But the more you look at these theories, you realize, but this doesn't actually seem to describe the behavior. So for example, if you are saving money in order to help your children, you should give it to them when they're younger, right? It's about the marginal utility of money, right? The idea that $100 $100 is more valuable to somebody who only has $1,000. That's a huge increase in what they can spend than it is to somebody with a million dollars. Just add to that the obvious observation that people tend to have more money as they get older. That means that money is more useful the younger you are. So if these really rich people were accumulating these assets in order to help their children, 
then the prediction would be that they're going to give a lot of that wealth away while they're still alive. And Joe, as I assume you know, this does not actually describe human behavior. Even the very richest people, the, typically the only reason they're giving money while they're still alive is tax savings. In the absence of tax savings, I doubt there would be much intergenerational transfer of wealth at all. I made some notes from your work that the long-term goals for wealth are spending, familial obligations, creating and preserving a position in society, good causes that you want to give to after your death, showing love that you just mentioned. And the other one, of course, is this idea of immortality. So how do those play into this idea. I always ask people to introspect about their own experience, right? And let's just pause for a moment and think about all these things. I don't doubt for a moment that all these are important factors, independence, freedom. There's lots of things that money can provide that, that are not directly linked to consumption. But the question becomes, how do you decide among them, right? So again, look, if somebody comes to me in advice for saving for retirement. I've got very simple advice. Don't spend any money, save everything you earn, and, and you can do them and don't assume any returns and you can do the math. Of course, if you're not spending any money in the first place, that's the question, Joe, I really need to understand is, okay, fine. Independ I want independence, but I also want to buy a new car. How do I choose between them? And again, the way you pose that question is a perfectly understandable economic way of thinking. And again, it, it, let me just go back into this question I'm really trying to ask. I'm asking two questions in this podcast. One is, why do people want to become rich in the first place? My basic answer is, it is definitely not in order to spend. I, there's no evidence in support of that idea. Okay, I would say I point to two reasons these people become super rich. In some cases, they just have a knack for making money and they have no particular interest in spending it on themselves. Rockefeller is an example of that. Charles Tiffany is an example of that. Honestly, a lot of rich people fall in that category. They have a knack for making money. They're not, again, they're not doing it. They just have a knack for making money. They like what they do and that makes money and they don't have a knack for spending it. So one possibility is it's dental billionaires. They just pile it up because they have nothing else to do with it. And I do think that describes a fair number of very wealthy people. The other category- They're in it for the game? Yeah, basically. Game. Again, we're back to where people derive utility from. Charles Tiffany liked business. He liked selling luxury goods to the wealthy, and he was extremely good at it. He just had no interest in luxury for himself. It was all about the selling. It wasn't about the actual having. And then the second category is people who are really just playing the status game, which is they're just trying to pile up more than the next guy. And let's also be clear, there's a lot of reason to think that as your resources grow, as your wealth grows, there's a crossover point. If you look at the writings of a lot of these very rich people, Vanderbilt talks about this, Rockefeller talks about this. They talk about the notion that at some point the money has become completely abstract. It's beyond anything that they could possibly spend. When, we, you know, we're always looking for what, what, how can I effectively compete with other people? Am I a good tennis player? I'm going to play more tennis. Am I good at making money? I'm going to make more money and I'm going to evaluate myself just like a tennis player would by how I do relative to other people. What other standard really is there? And Rockefeller is a great example of both. So I am convinced that Rockefeller, and by the way, Warren Buffett, there's plenty of evidence that suggests Warren Buffett had this in mind as well. They literally were aiming at becoming the richest person ever. That was their goal. But in both cases, it, their goal was significantly helped by the fact that they had discovered niches that they were really good at that made them a lot of money. In Rockefeller's case, he was great at the game of business. In Buffett's case, he was really great at the game of identifying in unpopular investments. So notice, however, neither of those pathways have anything to do with the spending of the money, not by the kids, not by anybody else. It's about piling up the money because you don't have anything more attractive to do with it. Maybe we could dig a little bit into the psychology of why we build a nest, of why we try to create a position and protect it in a society. And I think about this in terms of children, a lot of folks who were freewheeling 
investment bankers and living large, suddenly they have children and all of their goals change. And now it's everything is about the advantage of their children and thinking about their grandchildren and so on. And do you think that's a, there's some psychological explanation for this motivation to create, preserve, and pass on the world? Mm. Yeah. As a psychologist, I had some beliefs that, I don't know, I don't think they're that odd to psychologists, but I think to the average person, they're a little peculiar, right? So most of us, again, we're back to how we think about hard problems. And let's go back. So you've accumulated a lot of wealth and you have to figure out, all right, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to spend it? Am I going to give it away? Am I going to leave it to my kids or some other group of people? Okay. Now, leaving aside the particulars of how you think about it, let's just take a step back on what you think the problem is. In economic theory, what's going to happen here is you have this problem. It's your problem, right? And it's really meaningful to you. And what you're going to do is spend a lot of time thinking long and hard about what it is you really want and you know how to best accomplish that based on what you have. And in a certain sense, what you're asking is, oh, but you know, that what it is you really want seems to change over time. So how do we deal with that? But that's not actually my view about what's really going on. Humans, we are adapted to a social environment. And I don't think people really appreciate how meaningful and important that is. Humans follow what's called mimetic desire. What do I want? I want what other people want. And I do not think that people appreciate how deeply influential these social norms are on our behavior. In psychology, there's this term called the logic of appropriateness. Again, in the social science of economics, we have these models of how people make decisions based on this carefully cognitive process of asking, what's in my best interest in this situation? The logic of appropriateness, and there's a fair amount of evidence that says this is the way humans actually work, doesn't ask that question. It doesn't ask, what is best for me in this situation? The logic of appropriateness asks, what's a person like me supposed to do in a situation like this? Now, that's a really weird question when you pause and think about it. You're not asking what's in my self-interest. Just focus on the very wealthiest Americans of their time. If you go back to the early 19th century, John Jacob Astor, first the very richest American until he dies in 1830, then Cornelius Vanderbilt, who dies in like 1878 or something. In both cases, what these guys do with the enormous wealth they created is give it all to one son, primogeniture. But why? Because they really thought carefully. And by the way, Cornelius Vanderbilt certainly has written about why he was doing it. But I would simply say they're doing what they thought the social norm was for people of their class and time. And that norm was driven by what happened in Britain, primogeniture, the fact that a title would only go to the oldest male heir. Okay, that's the social norm they're coming out of. William Andrews Clark he dies in 1927, right? A hundred years or 70 years after these guys. He leaves his money equally to his children. That's why you get Clark, this daughter who dies many years later is so rich because she's gotten one fifth, I think, of this guy's enormous fortune. Equal division. Now, most of your listeners thinking you're going to go, oh, that's what I'm going to do, equal division. But from an economic perspective, this is just as insane as primogeniture. It makes no sense, right? And I'll explain in just one moment, but let me just say, equal division is a social norm. I believe that the vast majority of time people are using it is not because they've carefully thought and decided that's what they really want to do. It's because that's what everybody else does. Now, let me explain why it's not the right thing to do. Again, if you're thinking in economics, we're back to this marginal utility of wealth. Imagine you have two children. One child is a nursery school teacher. The other child is an investment banker. Wouldn't it make more sense to leave more money to the kid who's a nursery school teacher than the one who's an investment banker? Isn't that person going to be able to make better use of the money, and get more enjoyment out of it? So if you're some sense trying to equalize the benefit you're giving your children, you should not leave the money equally to them. Now, as a psychologist, I, I have some dispute. That's an economic perspective. Humans are psychological animals. And so there's other things going on. But I will just finalize this by saying, if you look at what's happening now with the giving pledge, right? Warren Buffett and Bill Gates have signed up, I don't even know how many billionaires now, who basically agreed to give away at least half of their wealth 
what better example of the power of a new social norm could we have than the fact that they're actively going out and using peer pressure to try and sign up as many people who say, leaving vast amounts of money to your kids, not such a great idea. Again, half is an interesting perspective. We can go back to why that's right. But I do expect that this, that social norm is changing. My aphorism about this is turning to the practical is leaving small amounts of money to your children. And in the world I live in, I fully acknowledge I have a very biased and distorted view of what a small amount of money is. But I'm talking about $5 million, $10 million, maybe $50 or $100 million, depending on the circumstances. Those are small amounts of money. That is like putting leverage on a business. When you add leverage to a business, you don't change the underlying nature of the business. The business is what it is. But if you put leverage on a good business, man, the profits just roll in. And if you put leverage on a bad business, you will implode that business. I think that's what it's true for kids. Parenting is hard. Life is hard. And giving money to kids, I don't think it really is going to necessarily change the underlying nature of who that kid is. But if that kid is entrepreneurial and creative, man, having a big pool of money to go out and make a business, wow, that kid can really be a great success. At the same time, if they're a drug addict and want to go into the drug business, I don't think that story is going to add end very well. Large amounts of money. And now we're talking billions of dollars. I think to give that to a child is pure curse. And the reason is exactly the thing you put your finger on. It is impossible for a child to create their own identity when they have inherited a billion dollars. It just is not going to happen. So let's talk about your podcast series, which is fascinating. I'm interested in the reason that you started it, the research that you did that led up to it. When I used to teach a class at Wharton on family wealth, I would begin with a mini case talking about the story of Uget Clark. This is the woman who was one of the wealthiest women in America, heir, heiress to an enormous fortune and spent the last 20 years of her life in a hospital room in New York City. It's a fascinating book, by the way, Empty Mansions, if your readers are interested. And one simple point I made at the beginning of that case is I had a picture of Uget with her father, William Andrews Clark, that was taken about 1912. So she's about six years old in this picture. She would go on to die in 2010 at the age of 104. Barack Obama was president of the United States when she passes away. Her father, William Andrews Clark, was born in 1838. When he was born, Martin Van Buren was president of the United States. That's a single generation, father and daughter, that spans a period of 170 years. There aren't a lot of companies that are in business for 170 years. So it is worth hearing that families exist. They are organizations, but they exist on a different time scale. When you are a member of a wealthy family, the family takes over and your identity gets subsumed within that. And that is psychologically very problematic for most people. It's an interesting question whether that was true historically as well, or that's a feature of modern times that people really need to establish their own identity independent of their family. But I think that is a central issue. I'm interested, what does that person do to deal with that? Coming to grips with this incredible legacy that often carries all of these seeming huge benefits, the money, but carries a lot of burdens with it as well. This is part of what I find so interesting about the story of John D. Rockefeller and his son, also named John D. Rockefeller. And I don't think it's a coincidence that these guys, my basic argument is what happens in this case is the senior basically creates a clone of himself, which is why he's comfortable leaving so much wealth to the son rather than to his daughters. But the problem from the son's perspective is that it it creates a real problem for him in terms of establishing who he is and what he wants to do. And even today, I've discovered as I talk to people about that story, those two people get confused all the time. Lots of people do not understand these are actually two separate people, father and son. They just see them as John D. Rockefeller and they get confused about who's who. And part of the reason is exactly because this is one case where the son was perfectly willing to be his father's devoted acolyte for his entire life. He turned his life into being about his father's legacy. And you know whether it really worked for him as an individual, that's an open question. But again, this is what I'm telling in my podcast, these individual stories of how both the person who's made it as well as the person who's receiving it 
how do they react to the circumstances? What are the problems that can arise? I do focus mostly on sort of dysfunctional stories because they're a little bit more interesting. But also when it does go right, I developed a lot of respect for John Rockefeller Sr. Because for all his peculiarities, I think he understood basically what he was trying to accomplish and why. But as I also point out, he, this required him to accept some bad sides. He had terrible relationships with his daughters, one daughter in particular. And he accepted that as the price he needed to pay to accomplish what he thought was the right thing to do with this enormous wealth that he built up. Economists also have this notion of what's called revealed preference, right? That if you want to ask somebody, what do you like and what's your objectives? Don't just ask them because they have no incentive to tell you the truth. Give them a choice. Instead of saying, do you like bananas or apples? Actually, give them, here's a banana, here's an apple. Which one would you like? And if they choose the banana, you can assume that they prefer bananas over apples. So th that's the basic idea. Again, it sounds reasonable on the surface, although I will point to some problems with it. But what I wanted to do was actually look at the revealed preference of very wealthy people as shown in their wills. What did they actually do with the money? And in particular, since I was trying to write an academic paper, did what they do with the money, was it consistent with any bequest theory that we have about why they're building it up in the first place? And uh, cut to the chase. Uh, so what I, the first step in the process was just to create a list of the richest Americans ever, which in and of itself was a pretty interesting exercise. I now have a spreadsheet with about 400 names on it. I'm not 100% sure I have the 400 richest Americans ever. But I'll bet you I have 400 of the 500 richest Americans ever. Did you get any insight into who was the wealthiest of all time? So there's a lot of reasons to say, oh, Rockefeller is definitely number one on the list. However, I actually suspect that the richest American of all time was none of the above. It was actually William Henry Vanderbilt, who was Vanderbilt's son. Because when Cornelius Vanderbilt died, he left $100 million and he left 95% of that to this one son. The son proceeded to double that money in about eight years. And the reason I know that with some certainty is because he also died eight years later. So he found the burden of that fortune to be so overwhelming, it almost literally killed him. But I believe that his $200 million fortune, and again, I'm saying that's about 1880, I think if you compare that to GNP, that's actually the biggest number ever. And by the way, again, the irony of the Vanderbilt story, as I'm sure many people are aware, is the family is effectively gone. They're certainly Vanderbilt descendants, but we don't think of them as being fabulously wealthy. What they've left behind is a history of some enormous mansions, a lot of them. That's where the Vanderbilt money effectively went, <laughs> a lot of fancy mansions. Interesting. So let's get back to your database. So wills are public documents. Back in the Gilded Age, almost all of these people, when they died, their wealth was transferred via will. So literally, the New York Times would have an article saying, has died, this is who gets how much. So that was why I was able to start the project. And I did create a database, and I became dissatisfied with this academic paper and decided, however, that the stories I had come across, forget about the 400 different names, some of the stories of what happened were just crazy. They were just insane. And they were so fascinating. I wanted to explore them more deeply and ultimately decided that the stories were what I wanted to share, which is why I created the podcast. Now, Mark Hopkins is actually the first story and, and part of really the genesis of this whole project. I had discovered this book that attempted to list the 100 richest Americans ever. So four of the guys on that list were the four partners in the Central Pacific Railroad, which was effectively the first transcontinental railroad. Not surprisingly, these four partners became very rich. The most famous of the partners was Leland Stanford. Stanford University is named after him. He had a partner, however, named Mark Hopkins. Mark Hopkins is so obscure that even his biography is controversial. For example, there were two Mark Hopkins by the same name living in Sacramento at the same time in the 1860s. One of them was this rich Mark Hopkins who was a partner in the railroad. The other one was a poor Mark Hopkins who also happened to work for the railroad. He died. His widow went to work for the other richer Mark Hopkins. And then the rich Mark Hopkins died. And this woman who had been married to the poor Mark Hopkins pretended that she had been the wife of the rich Mark Hopkins 
and managed to get his $24 million estate. And I'm reading this story and I'm going, holy cow, could that actually be true? And if it is true, how did they discover this fraud? When did they discover it? So to cut to the chase, and I encourage listeners to listen to the podcast, that story is not true. It is completely made up. It was made up for a very particular purpose, in fact. And the purpose relates to the fact that the reason the Mark Hopkins story goes so haywire and crazy is that when Mark Hopkins died in 1878, he left an estate of $24 million, but he didn't have a will. But Hopkins was a railroad baron. He's a very industrious guy. Surely he was thinking about his legacy and planning ahead. You would absolutely think that. By the way, he's not the only guy in my database who did not have a will, but it is extremely rare. And it's certainly worth thinking more deeply. Now, in his case, it is noteworthy. He didn't have any children, I should say. My argument is the reason the guy didn't have a will is because he was one of these accidental billionaires. In fact, he was so thrifty. The whole topic of money just made him deeply uncomfortable. He really didn't want to acknowledge how rich he'd become. Now, Mark Hopkins did have a widow. And in the end, the probate court had awarded her three quarters of the estate. So at one level, it worked perfectly. But now, again, what's going to end up happening with Mark Hopkins' money is and you're going to the listeners are going to have to follow along mark hopkins money ends up in the hands of the cousins of the secretary of the second husband of his widow the cousins of the secretary of the second husband of his widow and so part of what also happens and it relates to that crazy story i began with 50 years after the guy is dead, a lot of people are looking at this going, the cousins of the secretary, the second husband of his widow. That's just so random to end up with the money. Why not me? Why shouldn't I get that money? So basically, there were a thousand people claiming to be the legitimate heir of Mark Hopkins by the 1920s. And that story goes on for another 50 years of arguments about this estate. I have to ask you about the spite clause. Yeah. Because that clearly is one of the stories that really jumps out. The story of Wellington Burt. Yeah. Yes. So the story of Wellington Burt is Burt was a timber baron who lived in Michigan and died in, I think, 1918. So when he died, he left an estate, I believe it was about $12 million. And what's unusual about the story of Wellington Burt is he left his money in a trust. In essence, what Burt wanted to do, if he could have, was to not leave his money to anybody. Now, because that was not legally possible, he basically ended up leaving a trust that was going to last as long as it could possibly last and then distribute money among the descendants of his grandchildren. So he explicitly said, I do not want any of my living grandchildren to get any of this money. Did they die 21 years after they die? It's going to be distributed among their descendants. So the end result of the story, he dies in 1918. That although there were a lot of legal battles over that trust and the family was able to extract a fair amount of assets out of it over the years, at the end of the day, a hundred million dollar trust was finally dissolved in 2010, almost a hundred years after he had died. And the money was split up among essentially random people. They were descendants of Wellington Burt, but of course they were his great grandchildren and great grandchildren. And so we're back to. What was he trying to accomplish? Now, in the case of Wellington Burt, my argument is this guy had actually gone senile. He died at a relatively old age. He was a cantankerous person to begin with. And I, one thing that was fascinating as I was doing this project is how often when you look at the decision of who they want to leave the money to, the central question seems to be who they want to make sure doesn't get the money at all. Now, again, that's a weird way of thinking about it from an economic perspective. But from a human psychological perspective, that seems to be very important to a lot of people. They don't care as much about who does get the money, but they want to make damn sure that person who did me wrong never gets any of it. I think in the case of Wellington Burt, and let's be clear, the people who appear on this list include his own children and grandchildren. But I do think he, here is a case of a guy who just kept adding names to the list of people he didn't want to get his money until he ran out of people. He basically had everybody on the list. And so ends up with this, this the, sort of the legal term is a spite trust, which is a trust that is intended not to give any money to anybody. 
As I said, though, it's not the only story in history like that. And I, again, I suspect that like a lot of things, when you put out a podcast like that and you give people alternative social norms to think about, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that that but a lot more people start thinking that's not a bad idea. My joke is so the title of my podcast is you can't take it with you. But I point out that actually the Egyptians did believe you could take your wealth with you. And that's what they did. Just pause for a moment and think about how rich the pharaohs really would have been if they did what we think is the right thing to do, which is leave money for your kids. All of that gold that was piled up in these tombs and, of course, immediately stolen would instead have been in the palace of the pharaoh. My God, these you talk about richest people in history. It would have, wouldn't have been any comparison. But they believed you could take it with you. And most importantly, the social norm was that was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You want to take care of your afterlife. Now, I am also convinced there are a lot of rich people today who would love to build a golden pyramid and bury themselves in it if it was socially appropriate. But my God, if somebody did that today, people would look like you were insane. That's not socially appropriate at all. So we're back to how powerful these social norms that are not really fully rational and the Egyptians are the perfect example, how powerful they are that if you believe, if your society tells you, you can take this with you, you will. And if your society tells you, oh, no, that's not something that's possible, you won't. So, of course, today I say the pyramid foundations are the modern pyramids. That's what people are doing. To, and you ask the question about immortality. There's a whole branch of psychology called terror management theory that says a lot of the unusual things that humans do are driven by the fact that we're the only creature that's aware of our own mortality. And we're back to the dynastic idea. But I also, I cannot emphasize enough to the modern people, you know, modern sensibility, that idea of, oh, creating a dynasty. Yeah, that's the right way of doing it. But it's, it's as arbitrary as any of these other mechanisms for ensuring immortality because we do die. So they're all socially mediated ways of believing what the money is for. So your conclusion at the end of the podcast is that economic theory is wrong. I'm not sure I'd make this explicit at the end of the podcast. The way I would put it here is I believe that economic theory is somewhere between deeply misleading and just outright wrong. I think that the accumulation of wealth at the high levels is a pretty inelastic activity. In other words, it doesn't matter how much they're being taxed because the money itself is not doing it because of the concern to get marginal money. Just as an example, if I want to be the richest person in America and I have to pay a tax of 25% on everything I earn, but the guy next to me also is paying a tax of 25%, that's not going to affect our behavior. We're still competing with each other to have more money. We both have a basic cost of generating that money, but it's not going to change our behavior. So one of my arguments is if in fact people are not building up this wealth in order to spend it in the future, they're not building it up so their kids can spend it in the future. From a logical perspective, therefore, a tax is not going to change behavior. So economic theory has some important implications in terms of how we think about what public policies we want to support. And I recognize that many people are opposed to taxation on estates, not because of a practical issue, but they just don't think it's fair. That's fine. I'm not, as a scientist, I can't really be in the business of what's fair or not. That's subjective. But I can be in the business of asking the practical question of, will this change people's behavior? And my argument is no. I do not believe it would change people's behavior. And again, let me also be clear. I'm not opposed to wealth. I, as I joke, I'm a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. Not only am I not opposed to wealth, I don't, I'm not one of these guys who think billionaires are a policy failure, blah, blah, blah. And I also am not opposed to passing on wealth to your kids. I've done it. And I think it's a fine and noble thing to do. I do think, however, people do not take a step back and think more deeply about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Let me ask you a question. So how has your research affected your own estate planning? Yeah, I'd, I guess I would say like a lot of research, it is motivated by the things I already believe. So at a certain level, I don't think it's influenced it as much because it would be more accurate to say that my research was driven by my beliefs about what was best to do in my own circumstance. Then again, just summarizing for people, I think I've touched upon it. I think it's great to help your kids. I got no problem with that. 
I think it's, I think you need to be wary about what it really means to help your kids and at what point you're no longer helping your kids. I think it's important to think about if you are helping your kids, do you really want to wait until you die to leave money to them? That doesn't strike me as a very good idea. But at the end of the day, I do think that particularly for the people I'm focused on, these absolutely nominal fortunes, that really the best thing to do with it is give it away. And it's almost as if it's, I'm not claiming that it's necessarily, I'm not claiming you're going to solve the world's problems or necessarily feel great about yourself, but it's the least bad option, which is a very strange way of thinking about having accumulated a billion dollars, that somehow you're stuck with the least bad option. Andrew Carnegie wrote a very famous essay in 1888 that is frequently called the Gospel of Wealth. And remember, when he's writing this essay, Carnegie may well have been the richest American. And he's very point blank about it. He says, look, the evidence is crystal clear that leaving this money to your children is not a good idea. He's not even, he doesn't even, not Nambi page. It's, it's obvious that's a terrible idea. What other choices do you have? You can leave it behind and let the government take it. But really, his argument, which again, I don't fully agree with, but his argument is, look, if you were savvy enough and capable enough to accumulate this wealth, then you're probably the best person to try and use it to benefit the community at large. That's what he's saying is what wealth really is for is it should be for benefiting the community at large. And I totally buy into that. I do think, again, And again, I'm part of this. I'm part of our culture. I like the idea. And again, I feel in my own case, and maybe it's worth noting, you asked about my money story. I made a good amount of money on my own. I was an investment banker for a while. I've been a pretty successful investor. I've made a lot of good investment decisions. I feel great about the, I know, again, psychologically, I think it's important to distinguish people feel differently about money they made from their own efforts versus money you didn't. I'm not, I don't think of myself as an extremist. I do see myself in, in, in this long tradition of people who are saying, look, practically, if you look at the reality of the situation, where did the money come from in the first place? It came from the community, Right. Sure, you were providing something of value to the community, but the community was providing something of value back to you. And so in a certain sense, wealth, all wealth, and again, I don't want to sound like a communist because I'm definitely not, but in some sense, all wealth is social. You know, It belongs to everybody. And reinvesting it back into the world at large, that's a good thing to do. And by the way, again, I speak as a father. I love my two daughters very dearly. But when I look at my own resources, and let me be clear, I'm not a billionaire. I'm nowhere close to that class. But even at my level of resources, if I say, which is better to give another $1,000 to my already wealthy daughters or to give $1,000 to support something in the world at large that I think is important and will create a better world for them, that doesn't seem like a very hard decision to me. That to, to think that that thousand dollars will be more beneficial invested outside to create a better world for them. So that I think is my bottom line point about this. And again, I go back the specific stories I tell, so many of which things go wrong. The one story where I really feel things go right, the Rockefeller story, is because even though John D. Rockefeller was absolutely motivated by this desire to become incredibly rich. And again, the Rockefeller story is fascinating. His psychology is bizarre because he had these two very ill Mitch parents. He got that notion of wanting to become rich from his dad, who was a con man, a philanderer, just a problematic character. But then from his mother, who is this deeply religious character, he got this notion of what to do with it. And Rockefeller explicitly said he believed that it was the purpose of a man to get all he can and to give all he can. And God bless him, he lived by that. And what I find so ironic is when people ask me, because I do talk to a lot of very wealthy families, and obviously I understand they're very concerned. How do I do? How do I use this money to help the family and avoid harming them? The Rockefeller story to me shows that money has to be about something that's beyond the family itself. If you think the money is just about providing luxury for your family, That is not a family that's going to sustain itself over long periods of time. The Rockefeller story ironically suggests that it is, in fact, and again, I'm not a big believer in sort of secret ideas about you give and you get, but there does seem to be something to this idea that the core of the Rockefeller success was building the wealth around giving. And that ironically, by giving so much away, 
they were able to sustain the family over a longer period of time. And of course, the Rockefellers compared to the Vanderbilt and the Astors that were not philanthropically inclined, originally at least, the Rockefellers is still around and they're still respected. And there's, again, I've known a number of members of that family. And by and large, I, they have not struck me as people who are lost. They do seem to have internalized what the money can be good for and what it cannot be good for. Back well, outside to the of that, that it's a outside tool. of that case, which is they are somewhat unique. Do you think that there is a role for a, this idea that people have of a mission in a family? I totally think that's the, that exa- that's exactly what it is. Let's go back to this whole idea of a family in the first place. So one thing you can certainly do with wealth is put in a big trust and everybody draws from that trust. But an alternative is you just split it up all the among your kids and give it to them and let them go their own way. So why do you want to keep the family together? And again, I think in many cases, it's a mistake. That's, that's going to create more conflict than it's really going to solve. But to the extent that you do want to do that, I think that will only work if you have a mission. Again, if the family, and, and now, by the way, a business can be a mission. But as I already noted, in America, that's very hard to sustain. But some successful families are built around the mission being, we have this business, that's our identity. But if that's not where you are, then you have some alternative mission. What other missions are possible? Well, the most obvious mission is a philanthropic mission. I can imagine other institutional structures that give you some other kind of mission, but it gets weird and complicated. If if the money is just about helping individuals, just split it up and let them go their way. If you think the money has to be about something bigger, yeah, then it's incumbent upon you to express that mission. Although I'm not, I don't cover this story in my podcast, but from what I used to teach at at Wharton, I used to do a case about the Pritzker family. And Again, it's a fascinating story because in many ways, Jay Pritzker, who is probably deserves to be the title of the founder of that family, even though technically he isn't, he did all the things that I said you should do. He created this mission. He, he laid it out very explicitly for everybody. And it still failed pretty catastrophically. Now, the fam- you can argue about what was a failure meaningful because the family is still wealthy and many of them are very successful people, for example, the governor of Illinois. But it just goes to show that, it, that having a mission is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Again, this stuff is hard. Life is hard. There's no simple solutions. But I am a big believer that being more thoughtful about what you're trying to accomplish, understanding how important social norms are going to be in that decision process. And I would be very pleased if having listened to some of these podcasts, people decide to have conversations with their own family because they are. These are tough, difficult issues. And I'm a big believer that, and going back to the story of Mark Hopkins, that if there is a single problem that I would identify as the most universal one, it is inadequate communication. Once again, Good communication is not sufficient. The Pritzker story shows that things can still go wrong. But I think that, and let me just draw, bring back this issue of leaving money equally. I am intending to leave money equally to my own children because I don't have a real reason to do otherwise. And I'm sure that fits a lot of other people's circumstances. I do strongly suspect, however, that there are many people out there who would like to leave more money more unequally, probably for the reasons I've identified. They're reluctant to do it because they're afraid of the consequences. And my observation is, I understand leaving money equally is easier because, again, people do equate money with love. And it seems like such an obvious thing to say, oh, I got screwed out of my will. That means my parents didn't love me much. I do think very strongly, though, that if you have a conversation with your children and you have a good relationship, which is always a critical point, Kids are willing to accept a lot of inequality. They're willing to accept a lot of different things as long as they understand the why, right? Now, again, not always, but I do think there's a lot to be said for explaining what you're doing, explaining why you're doing it. And I don't think people by and large do this as much as they ought to. Eric Schoenberg is the creator of the You Can't Take It With You podcast series. Thank you for joining us today, Eric. It's been a pleasure, Joe. Great talking with you as always. Thanks for listening. 
If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and take a minute to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate it.